the American Jewish Committee stood in vigilant brotherhood at the cradle of our emergent statehood. Israel admitted to membership in the United Nations. still are high as Iran promises to punish Israel. This day is a pivot of history. It heralds a new dawn of peace. For Jews and Muslims to come together to Auschwitz and Birkenau, it was an historic day. on the values that bind us together as Americans. We have such a strong and long history of Black America and the Jewish community coming together. Hello, and welcome to AJC Virtual Global Forum 2021. My name is Harriet Schleifer. I'm the president of American Jewish Committee. Last year, we joined together for our first ever virtual global forum. And while we are disappointed as we were then that we can't be together in person, we're glad to be together online bringing an ever-expanding global audience into our AJC family. The good news is the state of the pandemic looks quite different than it did just 12 short months ago. We're hopeful that the situation will continue to improve, and I'm especially excited to announce that we will return to Washington, D.C. next May for AJC Global Forum 2022. We hope to see you all there. For those of you who are tuning into AJC programming for the first time, American Jewish Committee is the leading global Jewish advocacy organization working to fight anti-Semitism and all forms of hate, strengthen Israel's place in the world, and defend democratic values. And AJC Global Forum is the premier global Jewish advocacy event of the year. From discussions with world leaders to spirited policy conversations, together over the next four days, we will examine many of the critical issues facing the Jewish people and the state of Israel. This year, our program is focused on reimagining what's possible. As we have for nearly 115 years, AJC continues to envision and work toward a better world. Just as the Abraham Accords demonstrated how dramatically the world can shift for the better, we believe that together we can push back against the tides of anti-Semitism and hate. A reimagined Middle East with Israel at peace with all her neighbors is possible. And yes, we can and we must restore and renew a deeply divided America. You will see this vision reflected in the incredible program we're about to begin. But first, we have to acknowledge what is happening at this moment. Like many of you, I'm deeply upset and angered by recent events. We witnessed an assault on the state of Israel, 
both by the terrorists on its borders and in the war of public opinion. Then we saw a surge in anti-Semitism around the world, including here at home. Jews were attacked in the streets from New York to Los Angeles simply for being Jewish. Even as we see a future full of possibilities and big ideas, we also know that this moment requires our urgent attention. And when I say our attention, I mean not only AJCs, but the attention of all people of goodwill. Though this moment feels particularly difficult, as a Jew, I feel commanded to believe in tikva, hope. In that spirit, it's my pleasure to introduce a lifelong Jewish activist who's been in the trenches for decades, but has never stopped reimagining what's possible. Our CEO, David Harris. Thank you, Harriet, for your passionate leadership. Since Israel's rebirth in May 1948, AJC has stood by its side. And what a journey it's been. In 1948, 650,000 Jews lived in what is today Israel. It was just three years after the Shoah, and five standing Arab armies set out to destroy the embryonic state. Fast forward 73 years, and look at what's been achieved. Israel today is a pulsating democracy, a multicultural society, a country of over 9 million people, able to defend itself, and at the same time, making extraordinary contributions as the startup nation to the world. And since then, six Arab countries have made peace with Israel, and there are several others on the sidelines that are watching with curiosity. Maybe they'll join. But in the meantime, there are still others, states and non-state actors, who still wish to destroy the Jewish state. One of those actors is Hamas, and last month, encouraged by its sponsor Iran, it launched another war against the state of Israel, and thousands of rockets were fired from Gaza indiscriminately across Israel, sending millions of Israelis into shelters, while the IDF sought to defend the country against the terrorists. We, AJC, stood with Israel then as we do always. And as soon as the conflict ended, we took a solidarity mission to Israel. And while we were there, people expressed their appreciation for our visit. But they also asked us, did others understand what had happened? Did others understand the difference between an aggressor, Hamas, and the victim, Israel? Between the arsonist, Hamas, and the firefighter, Israel? And we were able to say that, yes, there were many who did, even as there were others who refused to. And among those who stood by Israel's side were 30 nations. We believe that a friend in need is indeed a friend indeed. And we want to honor those 30 nations. And we want you to know those 30 nations as well. And we hope you'll find ways to express your gratitude as we have done. And by extension, you'll see nations that are missing. Some may be surprising omissions. But no, they did not stand by Israel's side. Either they stood on the 50-yard line, issuing wishy-washy statements, or they simply vanished. But we want to honor those 30 nations. And following the short video you're about to see, we also wanted to bring you the faces and the voices and the stories of five remarkable Israelis. Israelis that you may not have seen on your television screens over the last several weeks because their narratives did not necessarily fit the narratives that those media outlets wanted to peddle. But you need to hear those voices, and you need to be reminded, as we've been reminded, of the extraordinary resilience and creativity and courage and ingenuity of Israelis. So, as we begin the 2021 AJC Virtual Global Forum, let's begin by reaffirming our friendship and our support for the State of Israel. Enjoy.
אנחנו לפני כחודשיים ציינו מלאת עשר שנים ליירוט הראשון של כיפת ברזל באשקלון. אתה, היה אירוע תקשורתי רב עוד שאחר כך בעקבות ההסלמה שהייתה בדרום האירוע הזה קצת דעך אבל יש לו חשיבות רפאל שאני הייתי ראש חטיבת הטילים ומערכות נגד טילים ברפאל עשתה משהו שאף אחד לא האמין שאפשר לעשות וזה שתוך שלוש שנים הצלחנו לממש מערכת מצילת חיים. אני חושב שצריך להסביר איך זה קרה שהצלחנו תוך שלוש שנים, מה הדבר שדחף אותנו, שגם לנו למוטיבציה הגדולה הזאת שתוך שלוש שנים אנחנו הצלחנו לפתח מערכת מאוד מורכבת. אז קודם כל יש לנו כמובן ברפאל את הניסיון בפיתוח של טילי אוויר אוויר מתקדמים ומערכות אחרות, ככה ש... היינו בשלים מבחינה טכנית לעשות את הדבר הזה. אבל אני חושב שצריך להבין עוד משהו. ההורים שלי ברחו מפולין לרוסיה במלחמת העולם השנייה כי לא היה מה שיגן עליהם. גם במלחמת, במלחמת המפרץ ב-1991 אנשים ברחו מהמרכז לצפון כי מעיראק יראו עלינו סקאדים ולא היה מה שיגן עליהם. אפילו במלחמת לבנון השנייה ב-2006 אנשים עזבו את הצפון ועברו למרכז ולדרום כי לא הייתה מערכת שתגן עליהם. אז אם יש משהו שלמדנו מכל ההיסטוריה הזאת זה שמדינת ישראל חייבת שתהיה לה מערכת שיודעת להגן על אזרחיה. אבל יש עוד משהו. אני חושב שמערכת כיפת ברזל מגינה לא רק על, מד... על תושבי מדינת ישראל אלא היא מגינה גם על הערבים תושבי עזה. אני בטוח שאם לא הייתה מערכת כיפת ברזל במדינת ישראל שהצילה עשרות ומאות של אנשים והצילה רכוש רב, אני בטוח שהיה צריך להיכנס לתוך עזה בכוחות אה, טנקים, מטוסים, אה, חיל רגלים וכך הלאה, מה שהיה גורם כמובן לנפגעים בצד הישראלי, אבל גם היה גורם לאלפי הרוגים בעזה. אה, ולכן בסך הכל מערכת כיפת ברזל היא מצילת חיים גם בישראל אבל גם לאלה ש... שתוקפים אותנו. אני מציין את זה בגלל שאנשים אומרים אה זה לא פייר למדינת ישראל יש כיפת ברזל ולנו לא היה אז לכן היה להם יותר קל. אז אני אומר שכיפת ברזל זאת המערכת שעזרה גם לזה שכמות הנפגעים בעזה הייתה המינימלית ואני יודע מידע אישי שצה"ל עשה את כל מה שהוא יכול כדי להמעיט בפגיעה בלא מעורבים. אני חושב שזו הגדולה שלנו, גם לדעת להגן על עצמנו היטב וגם להתקיף את היעדים הנכונים ולא להתקיף אה, לא מעורבים. נכון, נפגעים אנשים משני הצדדים, אה, נהרגו ילדים בעזה, נהרג ילד חמוד בן חמש ב- באשקלון, ילד חמוד שלא עשה שום דבר, הוא פשוט היה בחדר וירו עליו רקטה, הרקטה הזאת פגעה בו. במקרה הזה כיפת ברזל שיש לה אה, סיכויי אה, הגנה מאוד גבוהים של מעל 90 אחוז לא הצליחה להשמיד את הרקטה, הרקטה פגעה בבניין וילד בן חמש, דניאל, נהרג. היינו מאוד עצובים לשמוע את הדבר הזה. סך הכל מערכת כיפת ברזל היא מערכת שפותחה במאמץ מאוד גדול ישראלי אבל ההצטיידות של המערכת, כל הטילים שנקנו וכך הלאה, הם אה, הצטיידות אה, בזכות הכסף האמריקאי שהגיע למדינת ישראל. הכסף האמריקאי שהגיע למדינת ישראל, אני חושב שכל דולר שהגיע אפשר לסמן באיזה בית הוא הציל את התושבים שלו או את הבית שלו מפגיעה מרקטה שנורית על עזה. הם בעזה יורים עלינו רקטות כדי לפגוע באזרחים. אנחנו משתדלים ככל שאפשר, ואמרתי את זה מקודם, למנוע הרג של אזרחים ולהגן בסך הכל על החיים של עצמנו. אז כיפת ברזל היא סיפור הצלחה, גם במובן של הפיתוח המהיר והמוצלח, גם במובן של הטכנולוגיה ש- 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 שהוצגה פה, גם במובן של הלוחות הזמנים הקצרים, אבל גם במבחן התוצאה 
של הצלה של כל כך הרבה אנשים מערב מיותר. אני מקווה שיבוא היום שבו השכנים שלנו יבינו שהם צריכים להפסיק עם המלחמות האלה ולעשות איתנו שלום. כל אזרחי ישראל, כל מי שאני מכיר במדינת ישראל, מחפש ומחכה לשלום הזה. אבל כל זמן שאין את השלום הזה, אני אומר שטוב שיש כיפת ברזל. זה הסיפור האמיתי של כיפת ברזל, שלא תשמעו את זה בתקשורת. Hello, my name is Alice Kalman. I'm a lieutenant in the reserve of Iron Dome in the Israeli Air Forces. In March 2015, I started my mandatory service. I decided to volunteer to the combat forces, where men and women have the same conditions and duties. Throughout my six years of service, I had the privilege to command soldiers and participate in protecting the citizens of Israel. My grandmother and grandfather live in Ashkelon, a city located in the south of Israel that suffers from a heavy rocket fire for a long period of time. For me and many others, serving in the Iron Dome is not only a national mission, but also a personal one. During the last conflict between Hamas and Israel, we suffered a very intensive rocket fire to many Israeli cities. We had the urgent need to protect ourselves. As soon as the siren started, a lot of released soldiers and officers were called to the reserve in order to help our units. People left their jobs, schools, and families in order to give a hand in the intensive mission of Homeland Defense. 75% of the rocket that has been fired into Israel over the last decade were fired during the span of nine days in the last operation. Thanks to the hard work of Iron Dome soldiers and many others, we were able to intercept 90% of the rockets launched to Israeli cities. Even though I'm not a soldier anymore, I still feel tremendously connected to my unit, and I have an ongoing obligation to support them when needed. I'm enormously proud to be a part of a system that protects so many people, including my own friends and family. We have a responsibility to protect one another. This is the true story of Israel. Hello, uh, my name is Professor Dr. Yaniv Scherer. I am the CEO and Medical Director of Barzilai Medical Center in Ashkelon, Israel. Ashkelon is located about seven miles north to the Gaza Strip. Uh, Barzilai Medical Center is probably the most threatened uh, hospital or medical center, not only in Israel, but in the entire world. The recent campaign of Guardian of the Wars that just ended a few days ago actually emphasized that point very well. Within 11 days of uh, fighting between Israel and uh, the Hamas at the Gaza Strip, about 1,000 missiles were directed uh, to Ashkelon city, and close to 100 of them fell within the area of the city. Actually, the, on the last day of the campaign, a missile directed from Gaza fell within the promises of the hospital near the entrance of the emergency department. Barzilla Medical Center, uh, immediately when the campaign started on May 10 uh, at 6 p.m., transformed from a regular hospital, which is very busy with 3,000 employees, more than 600 beds of hospitalized patients, into a complete emergency form. We moved all of the departments that are still unprotected uh, from the regular place into shelters, provisional shelters, which include also our nursery, our neonatal ICU, pediatric departments, different ICUs, geriatric department, neurology, and many other departments. And at the same time, we began receiving many casualties from the falling missiles of the Ashkelon city and the surrounding area. Overall, we have treated within these 11 days the huge number of 460 patients, wounded patients, mostly civilians, some of them also soldiers that were treated within our hospital. Driving to the hospital and going back to the staff home was extremely dangerous. And although we have made sure that all of the patients and families and the staff are safe within the hospital because they were transferred into shelters, the driving to and from the hospital was, was not easy. Um, 
within the hospitals, among these 3,000 employees, we have close to 200 employees who belong to the Arab population of Israel. They are either Christians or Muslims. And they work with the Jewish population of the patients and the staff in perfect harmony. Some of these Arab populations also come from uh, the Western Bank and they are actually Palestinians. And also they work, some of them, in Barzillai Medical Center for many years. We traditionally also treat patients that come from Gaza Strip, um, either at the COVID-19 pandemic or even before that. And this includes also children and also patients undergoing chemotherapy uh, courses or uh, emergency surgical treatments. So uh, the success of our uh, functioning due in, in this time is double. On the one hand, we have succeeded to provide the best medical care to all of this huge number of patients, 460 patients wounded within 11 days. At the same time, we have made the, all of the patients and the staff safe during this time. Our challenge uh, for the future campaigns that unfortunately might follow because the situation did not change is to make sure that the entire medical center of Barzilai, which is the only medical center in this region of the country, the entire center should be protected 24 seven and to include all of the hospitalization and care departments I will give you a few examples of those departments and units that are still not protected. This includes our oncology service, our uh, dialysis uh, department, of course, the neonatal ICU, the nursery, and many more departments. So we still have challenge ahead of us, but to conclude, uh, the Barzilla Medical Center provided great medical care to all of the area population and would continue doing that if needed. So this is the story of the Barzilla University Medical Center. This is the true story of the state of Israel that you probably don't hear of in the media. Hello, my name is Erez Shitrit. I'm the Director of Security and Emergency in the city of Ashkelon. I'm here today to tell you my story about how it is to live in the city of Ashkelon under the threat, the ongoing threat from Gaza. This is a very unique situation we are at, at the city of Ashkelon. First, we have to understand that Ashkelon is the largest city on the southern border of Israel with Gaza, on the Mediterranean shores. It's a very peaceful city, very green city, in which people live calmly, asking for nothing but a day-to-day -day life, peace. And the past 20 years, we are suffering the most from the neighbors in the south. We should be very close neighbors. We should be very good friends, but we're not. At 2005, we left Israel, left Gaza, left all the infrastructure and the greenhouses for them to prosper, to have a good, healthy, common society in which we can interact with afterwards when peace will come eventually. But it didn't happen because there were sort of elections that were not non-democratical and Hamas took the, took the rule, took the govern. The first thing they did is killing all their opposition. So ever since the past 20 years, Hamas is in rule. <clears throat> time after time, whenever they feel they want something and Hamas is a terrorist organization, they are firing rockets and missiles at the city of Ashkelon. They are firing at all the area, all the terrains. But the city of Ashkelon is the biggest and most populated city close to Gaza. It means that it's so simple to hit Ashkelon. We were very fortunate to have the Iron Dome invented a few years back. It gave us a sense of security because it's the most sophisticated um, defense system in the world probably, definitely in Israel. But even the most protected system is only protecting 90%, 90% of all the rockets fired to Ashkelon. It's a Russian roulette. Nobody wants to play Russian roulette with their lives. Nobody, and we, parents, what can we tell our kids? 
the alarm sound. We run into the bomb shelter, if you have one, and we're waiting. The bomb shelter is not fully protected. And when the missiles fall on the ground, it's like an earthquake. The explosions, I can't describe it. You have to experience it to understand what it means to live in a war zone. And this is a war zone. The city of Ashkelon was a war zone for 14 days and nights. I spent outside running from arena to arena, from a scene to a scene, going into people's, I didn't know, people's homes I knew nothing about. I only got in my radio where it fell. I rushed there with my car or by foot to see a scene after scene, to see people injured, dead. You should understand, it's only 15 seconds, 15 seconds until it hits you. Now, what are 15 seconds? You're sitting watching your favorite TV show. It takes your mind a second or two to understand that the alarm is on again. And by the time you get up and start moving, it's already 10 seconds. The one-sided coverage of the conflict is so painful to me because I'm watching foreign news. I also read, I also speak and read Arabic. And I see how the conflict is represented. We are doing massacres. We are harming the innocent. Free Gaza. Free Gaza from what, people? Gaza is free. We don't rule Gaza. And I'm not speaking on the political point of view. I'm speaking as a father, as a person, as a neighbor of Gaza, from Ashkelon, to the people of Gaza in Gaza. I don't have hatred for the people in Gaza. But I'm having difficult times in understanding why. Why do they keep choosing this path of blood and death? It hurts. I wish that the world could hear our stories, could understand that we want, we want peace. We want our kids to be raised without alarms. We want to be able to open the borders with Gaza. We want to be able to go to the markets of Gaza, to buy in their markets maybe to support their economy, to allow them to visit us. But in order for this to happen, they have to change something, a very big issue in the, the way they think. First of all, they have to recognize our right to exist. The conflict is long lasting. Sometimes it looks like an endless, cycle of war and blood, but I can assure you, it must be. It has to come to an end eventually. And if the world would be smart enough, clever enough to give both sides the opportunity to be heard objectively, it will only aid both sides to end the conflict. The story of Israel is the wondrous realization of a 3,500 year link among a land, a faith, a language, a people, and a vision. It's an unparalleled story of tenacity and determination, of courage and renewal. And it's ultimately a metaphor for the triumph of enduring hope over the temptation of despair. It's my honor today to introduce Israeli President Reuven Rivlin. President Rivlin is a dear friend of AJC. You could even say he's part of our family. His first cousin, Fred Strober, is an active AJC leader in Philadelphia. I've had the privilege of meeting with President Rivlin on multiple occasions. 
I recall vividly when the president hosted an AJC delegation at his residence in 2018 during our global forum in Israel, the largest ever American Jewish advocacy event in Jerusalem's history. President Rivlin, we want you to know that the theme of this year's AJC Global Forum is reimagining what's possible. As president, you have indeed reimagined what's possible, both in the larger Middle East and also in the vital link between Israel and the diaspora relations and have made an everlasting contribution to Israel and the Jewish people. As your term comes to a close, Mr. President, we'd like to take this opportunity to salute you. Your voice has been one of unity and moral clarity. Your ability to bring together Israelis of all backgrounds in common cause will be among your most enduring legacies. Ladies and gentlemen, President Reuven Rivlin. Dear friends, it is, it is a great pleasure to take part in AJC Global Forum. For many years, the AJC has played a central role in advocating for the Jewish people, combating anti-Semitism, BDS, and supporting Israel's fight against terror. It has been a pleasure to host AJC delegations, and we deeply appreciate the Solidarity delegation which came to Israel during the last conflict. Friends, these days, the State of Israel is facing great challenges and opportunities. In the recent conflict in Gaza, the Hamas terrorist organization fired hundreds, even thousands of rockets at Israel's civilians. We hope that the ceasefire will last. Nevertheless, Israel will continue to take all necessary steps to ensure that our citizens can live in peace and security. I have made building partnerships and corporations between all of the communities in Israel one of my key goals as president. The violence has made clear how important this effort truly is. It will not be easy, but we must always remember that we are not doomed to live together. We are disdained to live together. And we must, we must walk together down the path of understanding and cooperation. In the international arena, along with expressions of support by Israel's friends, we are seeing the spread of anti-Israeli libels, which are dangerous, very dangerous. Criticism of Israeli policies is legitimate, but it should be criticism based on knowledge, not based on ignorance. We must preserve their ability to understand the situation in Israel on its own terms, rather than failing into the trap of using concepts taken from other contexts and countries. We also saw a rise of anti-Semitism. We expect world leaders to show zero zero tolerance for all forms of anti-Semitism, hatred, and racism, and to use all the tools at their disposal, from physical security and law enforcement to education and adopting, adopting the IHRA definition in order to combat this threat. I deeply I deeply appreciate, with all the citizens of Israel, the statements from President Biden and the U.S. administration condemning this rise of anti-Semitic hate. The U.S. has always been our closest ally, our allies in strategic, 
bipartisan, and based on shared values. The unique ties between our two countries have always been based on open discussion, transparency, and real-time coordination. I would like to thank the AJC for its world to promote Jewish-Muslim relation and ties between Israel and Arab states and for all that you do for Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you. Thank you for your friendship and partnership during my time as president. As we say in Hebrew, toda rabba. And God bless. May God bless all of you. Hello. My name is Bobby Lapin, and I have the privilege of serving on AJC's Executive Council and chairing AJC's Contemporary Jewish Life Commission. AJC's Global Forum always challenges our minds as we hear from policymakers, analysts, journalists, and government officials. But for the past few years, we have also included a series in our Global Forum programming which speaks to our hearts and to our souls, revealing the humanity within our work, the dynamism of our people, the sense of shared destiny, and the overarching inspiration of our global Jewish advocacy. I am honored to introduce this year's series, Faces of American Jewry. The American Jewish community has a storied history which spans over 360 years, and it continues to have an outsized impact on American life. Outside of Israel, America, of course, has the largest Jewish community in the world, numbering about 7 million. And each of us has a different story to tell about the meaning of our American and Jewish identities that they have for us. Each of these stories is a lens into the multifaceted and rich tapestry of American Jewish life. Now, over the next few days, we'll introduce you to a group of American Jews from our incredibly diverse, passionate, and creative American Jewish community. Now, no one small group can represent every American Jewish identity, but we very much hope that the words of these incredible individuals will give all of us a taste of some of the many different backgrounds, perspectives, and affiliations which make up our vibrant community. We know that their stories and their powerful, textured Jewish identities will inspire you and uplift you as they have me. So I hope you enjoy this experience and this series as much as I have. My name is Erica Mendel, and I work for Project Interchange at American Jewish Committee. I grew up in a traditional conservative household. I went to a traditional Jewish day school, a traditional conservative summer camp, and like many other American Jews, I took a gap year before college and spent 10 months living in Israel where I participated in a program that was centered around exploring and understanding Jewry worldwide. My sophomore year at the University of Michigan, a BDS resolution was presented to the student government. Like many other committed American Jews I knew on campus, I decided to get involved in combating it. I committed myself wholeheartedly to engaging with student leaders on the topic of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Our conversations quickly became a microcosm of a century-long conflict happening on the other side of the world. For the first time, I pushed myself out of my comfort zone, encountering and internalizing new perspectives and forcing myself to consider a variety of viewpoints and narratives. In the summer of 2014, after my sophomore year, like many of my friends, I had a summer internship a Goldman Fellowship at AJC. I came to work each morning as Israel engaged in one of the larger military operations of my lifetime, Suketan, Operation Protective Edge. That summer, I realized how impactful my Jewish upbringing and education was. I simultaneously realized how passionate my own Zionist identity had become. I knew the well-being of Jews worldwide and the security of Israel would be issues of lifelong importance to me. I grew up in a traditional Jewish, ho Jewish household, but in an untraditional decision, after graduating from Michigan, I made Aliyah and enlisted in the Israel Defense Forces. I spent the next two years serving as a Madrichat Shirion, an instructor in the Armored Corps. To many, this might seem like a contradiction. For a woman who identifies as liberal and progressive to be a Zionist so committed as to join the IDF, 
For me, these two identities go hand in hand. My American, Israeli, Jewish, progressive identity is complex and layered, and it's full of rich Jewish values. It is my own, but connected to my parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents' experiences. My identity was shaped by my upbringing, but cemented by my life experiences and my own decisions. It's defined by me alone, but still connected to the modern world in which I live and to the greater Jewish story that has spanned generations. I'm a proud American Jew. Hello, my name is Matthew Bronfman. I serve as the chair of AJC's Board of Trustees. Like most Jews, Israel is near and dear to my heart. And like most Jews, it makes me extremely angry and upset when malicious lies are spread about the Jewish state. When those untruths veer into outright anti-Semitism, it can feel like the odds are stacked against Israel. But the truth is, Israel is among the world's most dynamic countries. Why? Because the Jewish people dared to reimagine what's possible. Israel is the worldwide leader in administering the COVID-19 vaccine. The Israeli technology scene is booming. Israel democracy for all its citizens is flourishing, even if there are a few too many elections. And Israel is making peace with its, Arab, with its Arab neighbors. This is due to the ingenuity and drive of the Israeli people, of course. But I'm also proud that AJC's persistent advocacy, as Israeli leaders have themselves attested, has opened doors for Israel in places near and far. AJC played a key role in planting the seeds for the Abraham Accords. We've been traveling repeatedly and often quietly in the Arab world for more than 30 years. We've also worked to promote a vision of cooperation and prosperity among Israel and her Eastern Mediterranean neighbors, Greece and Cyprus. We've long championed relations between Israel and Azerbaijan, a key partner and a Shiite majority nation. And as far back as the late 1980s, we urged the Israeli government to focus more attention on Asia, especially India, Japan, and South Korea. We're proud of this record. It's made a real difference in the life of Israel and the Jewish people, but we can never rest on our laurels. The challenges await, the opportunities loom large. Join us in our efforts to reimagine what's possible. Together, let's become authors of history, not observers or bystanders.